Hey everyone, it's T, and welcome back to another episode of the Let the Right Ones In podcast. I'm sorry I've been away for so long. I did post a separate update video letting you guys know where I've been and why there hasn't been a new update in about a month or so. So I do apologize for the delay, but we're finally here with episode number two of our Dark Side of Animation series. For this episode, we're going to be talking about Don Bluth. This episode is going to be different from the other ones in the series as I'm going to be talking about the man himself as well as his whole filmography. So his whole career we're going to cover in this podcast. So it's definitely going to be a lot longer than any podcast we've ever done. But I just kind of wanted to do him justice because I feel like his whole career is important to talk about. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, I think as a whole, his career is important because it was marked by his failures just as much as his successes. If you were growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, even into the late 90s, you have probably seen some of Don Bluth's movies. Like I said, his career was full of high and lows and the failures were almost as important as his successes and he had quite a lot of failures which we'll talk about at least critically during this time everyone knows about kind of disney's renaissance around this time we had things like the lion king the little mermaid i think beauty and the beast came out around this time as well so we were starting to see a resurgence with disney animation and don bluth's works helped to create a darker alternative than to what Disney was giving us. His films were often very dark, not only in kind of color scheme for a lot of them, but also in subject matter. It was a little bit more adult, a little bit on the darker side, as we'll see when we discuss his stuff. But in the end of his movies, everything does turn out okay, which I think is important for children to see, even adults, because we all go through really dark and rough times throughout our lives and it's important to kind of discuss that and have children see that but also see that most of the time things will turn out okay and I think that's an important thing for anyone to learn especially you know now more than ever and of course because the subject matter was on the little darker mature side it could be appealing to adults who are stuck watching the films as well I know a lot of times people like to say, oh, we're just throwing the kids in front of the TV and fuck it, they're just going to watch whatever, which is true for some parents, but a lot of parents like my mom and I'm sure other, you know, moms and dads out there would sit with their children and still do sit with their children and watch whatever they're watching. And films like these with the darker subject matter, more mature subject matter can help captivate adult interest as well. And then of course later you can go on and have these hard conversations with your children. Like if they have questions about anything or if they're feeling anything, you guys can talk about it or discuss it. Or you could even just bring it up yourself and talk about the movie and see where things go. There's a quote from him that I wanted to share before we got into the nitty gritty, which I think pretty much sums up the importance of his movies and why I kind of like them. So basically the quote says, if you don't show the darkness, you don't appreciate the light. If it weren't for December, no one would appreciate May. It's just as important that you see both sides of that. As far as a happy ending, when you walk out of the theater, there's got to be something you have that you get to take home. What did it teach me? Am I a better person for having watched it? You can kind of see this in a lot of his movies. And like I said, I I think it's important that there is that dark subject matter there for kids and for them to be presented with it because let's face it in the times that we're living in and even you know in the late 80s early 90s things weren't exactly roses so I think it's important that kids had this kind of alternative or are still exposed to this kind of alternative now for them to relate to if they're going through a rougher time. Not everything's sunshine and roses for all children. So I feel like Don Bluth was important to show that, hey, even though your life isn't sunshine and roses right now, it can be. You just gotta hang in there. So 
Before we talk about his movies and stuff, let's talk about the man himself. He was born Don Virgil Bluth on September 13, 1937 in El Paso, Texas. His career started at Disney. You can see his works in Sleeping Beauty, Sword in the Stone, 101 Dalmatians. He took a small break from Disney for a while to do missionary work, but he did come back in 1971. Like every company, especially after you've come back for so long, you'll notice that there are cultural changes, particularly when there's new people involved, like there was here. Walt Disney had passed away after this time, and Disney decided to shift their focus from animation into more live action and corporate-driven needs rather than creativity at the time. So he wasn't super stoked about that. He worked on Robin Hood, The Rescuers, a few of the Winnie the Pooh movies, and Peach Dragon, and then lastly, The Fox on the Hound, which is the last film that he worked on at Disney, which he kind of fucked at the time. During the production of The Fox and the Hound, um, him and some of the production staff left. It's debated as to why he left. There was some turmoil during this time. What happened was around the time when he came back, the Nine Old Men, which were the kind of the head animators and stuff at Disney at the time during their golden age, they were retiring and things like that. So there wasn't anything in place structured at the time for the Nine Old Men to pass down things to Bluth and his partner Goldman. Well, who would become his partner at this time, Goldman, Gary Goldman. So there wasn't anything structured at that time to kind of mentor them and show them tips of the trade and things like that. So what Don and uh, Gary Goldman did was they decided to work on a short film called Banjo in the Woodpile to help prepare and to kind of employ some of the techniques that they would be using over at Disney. But in the end, they did end up leaving during the production of Fox and the Hound, like I mentioned, and they took a bunch of staff with them. According to an AV article I read, it's debated if he left because he favored animators that worked on Banjo and that caused tension and divide within the company. But it's also debated that he left because he didn't like the environment. He was starting to find it hostile and corporate that was only caring about making movies cheaply rather than the art. So putting corporate and financial needs of the company above creativity. So that's when he kind of branched off with Goldman who worked closely with him on a lot of his films, which we're going to start discussing. There's about 11 films that he did. I have not seen two out of these. And some of these I haven't watched in a very long time either. So excuse me if there's any inaccuracies or anything like that. I do apologize, but like I said, there's a few that I haven't watched in a super long time. And there's some that I haven't watched at all. So we're just going to do our best to go through his career and talk about why some of these movies were such failures and such successes and things of that nature. So we're going to start with his very first movie in 1982, which was The Secret of Nim. A lot of people are familiar with this one. I would say the most. It's probably one of his more notable films. It was originally pitched to Disney when he was there, but they rejected it. And it's based off of a book called Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. They couldn't call it Mrs. Frisbee and the and the Rats of Nim, not because of any legal kind of issues with the writer of the book, but because, you know, Frisbee is so close to the toy Frisbee, so they couldn't do that. So they changed the mother's name to Mrs. Brisbee instead. Fun fact for you what the movie is about is there's this widow mouse and she has four children two sons and two daughters and basically what happens is her son Timmy he gets really sick and he can't leave the house they live in kind of like this cinder block he can't leave the house and the farmer has to plow the field so she stops the farmer from plowing the field but she still has the problem of my kid is sick he can't go outside. He'll fucking die. So what she does is she visits the great owl and he tells her, 
you have to talk to the rats of Nim, they'll be able to help you move your house to someplace safe. And, you know, all of the, you and all of the kids can stay inside. So she goes to find the rats of Nim so they could move her house and shenanigans ensue. I really like it because like most of Don Blue's films, the animation is really great. And I think this is something, well, a story that while it is based on like a children's book, adults can relate to it because it's got that action adventure element to it. And the whole story is about a single mom that's trying to protect her family and her home. Her kid's sick and she doesn't want to potentially kill her child because the farmer has to plow the field and she can't move him. So she's trying to do what she's got to do to help protect her family and provide for them in a sense. There's lots of adult themes in the movie as well. There's the single mom aspect. There's a bit of betrayal, some murder. There's elements there of the dangers of animal research. Well, not exactly dangers, but the harm that animal research can cause. It doesn't go into as graphic detail as the plague dogs does. There is a scary scene where you do see the rats being, the rats and mice being transformed into intelligent beings. Like you see them going through pain as they're getting injected with the serum that makes them intelligent. But it brings up good ethical issues like how far is too far with animal research and then if the research kind of goes awry like it does with these rats, should they be exterminated or should they be allowed to live? It was a critical success, the movie overall, but it was a box office failure. So it didn't do too well at the box office, but it's gained cult status. I think any child of the late 80s, early 90s knows of this film, probably had it on VHS or DVD. I know I still have it on VHS as well as the second one, which Don Bluth was not involved with. He even commented somewhere, I forget exactly where, but I did see when I was doing my research that he was like, well, if, if it was such a failure, then why did they make a second one of it? Which is totally true. It makes sense. I haven't watched the second one in a really long time, but if I recall correctly, it was a disaster. <laughs> it wasn't nearly as good as the first one. That basically does it for The Secret of Nim. The second film that he did was an American tale, and this was done in 1986. This is one of the partnerships that he had with Steven Spielberg. This was one of the two films that he collaborated with Steven Spielberg on. Believe it or not, American Tale actually became the highest grossing non-Disney film. At the time, it beat out The Great Mouse Detective because they were kind of head to head in the box office. Basically, An American Tale is about this Russian immigrant mouse family who travel over to the United States. During the trip over, Fievel, which is the male main character, he gets separated from his family and survives in New York with the help of another mouse, Tony, who's an Italian-American mouse, and his girlfriend, who I believe was Irish American. At the same time, Fievel's also trying to find his family who presume him dead. Aside from the great animation, which is pretty much for all of his films, like I said, the movie talks about immigration and adjusting to a new place. Now more than ever, this movie is important because it talks about the immigration experience. Not to get too political, but the reason why people come to the United States is because they're looking for a better life. That's why anyone leaves any country that's war-torn, poverty-torn, economic struggles or discrimination there. People leave their home countries usually for the opportunity and chance at a better life, which is what Fievel and his family were doing. Of course, some people aren't going to take kindly to that, there's all different kinds of customs you have to learn, maybe new languages, in this case, the Mouskowitzes, which is Fievel's last name, didn't have to like learn a new language or anything like that. 
but they had to adjust to living in the city, new customs around them, new people, everything's kind of new. And then everyone as well, when you have people who are immigrants or outsiders coming into a new place, you also kind of have to get used to them. It's always kind of a give and take when there's new people around, even if you aren't an immigrant, like, you know, say a new person starts at your job. You kind of have to get used to them and their ways while they're getting used to you and your ways and adjustments and things like that. So I think this film definitely is, is important to show that people aren't just emigrating or moving for the fuck of it and to steal resources. They're coming in to the United States and other places to live a new life, to chase that American dream. Whether you believe in that or not, that's a big part of why people come here. The third film we're going to talk about was also a collaboration with Steven Spielberg, and this is probably also one of Don Bluth's most noted films, probably his most notable film, I would say, and that's The Land Before Time. It was done in 1988. Basically, what it's about is it's during the age of dinosaurs where there was a famine going on and all of the different herds of dinosaurs are migrating to this place called the Great Valley. The main character is Littlefoot and he sees this other dinosaur from a different species, the, you know, the three tops which are basically triceratops. And so him and the little triceratop girl, Sarah, start playing, but the father separates them. He's like, hey, you're from different herds, you know? Don't go fucking playing with each other. So basically they stop playing, but later him and uh, Littlefoot and Sarah, they meet up again and they start playing, but they're attacked by a shark tooth, which is basically a T-Rex. So the T-Rex attacks them, but Littlefoot's mother comes to save the day. Unfortunately, she passes away. And then there's also a big earthquake that separates Littlefoot and Sarah from the rest of their families and herds that are trying to get to the Great Valley. But Littlefoot's mom tells him what to do, where to go before she dies. And so it's about Littlefoot, Sarah, and a few other dinosaur children that they meet along the way. Ducky, Petrie, Spike, who are also of different species them banding together to make it to the Great Valley. For a fun fact, you may not have known, but child psychologists were brought in to make sure that the film wasn't too traumatizing for children. There's a lot of scary elements that could be troubling for children, like the scene with Littlefoot's mom dying, all the famine and death going around, the T-Rex attacks, the sharp tooth attacks. Those are pretty intense. So, Don Bluth and his team and Spielberg, of course, were pretty responsible in having a child psychologist or a team of them rather consult on the film to make sure that things weren't too scary for kids, which is appreciated because I was a kid (laughs) around this time. So it's good to know that they had the backs of children and didn't want to make things too scary for them. I really like this film because it deals with a lot of tough things and especially nowadays I think some of the themes that it talks about are super important. Like it talks about loss. I don't recall having ever seen anything except for like The Lion King around this time that kind of showed the death of a parent, at least for like kids movies. I'm sure there were other things. I know in my neighbor Totoro, the mom was sick. I think she had cancer or something like that. Maybe they didn't say, but I know in my neighbor Totoro, it did show that, you know, the mom was sick and in the hospital and stuff. But I don't think there was ever anything kind of showing a loss until then. I could be wrong. I don't know. But the movie did handle themes of loss pretty well, like Littlefoot's mom dying uh, and watching her die kind of in front of him. Of course, that's pretty traumatizing for a kid, even if it is a dinosaur. I mean, of course, it's pretty traumatizing. And the film wasn't just like, oh, your mom's gone too bad. We have to focus on other things and do other things. You could clearly see that he missed his mom and that it was troubling for him that she was gone. And I think it's important for films, especially for children, to talk about loss. 
We like to try to protect children from death and even ourselves as adults. I know we kind of actively kind of avoid talks about death and dying and we don't really want to think about it because death is something unknown. It's scary. It's, it's kind of taboo to talk or think about because like I said, it's an unknown. It's scary. And it's scary to, to think about, oh, fuck, what will happen if I die, if someone I love dies? And then when that hits us, it's, it can be really hard to deal with. So I think it's important that kids have something to, go, to, to see that, okay, well, this character, they've had a parent or someone close to them pass away, but they're dealing with it, just doing their best to survive and to move on but they haven't completely forgotten them. The loss kind of sticks with Littlefoot throughout his journey to the Great Valley. And I think that's an important thing because you don't just forget a loss. In The Lion King, where we have a similar situation almost, except for Mufasa's murdered instead of dying defending uh, his child like Littlefoot's mom was. We have a situation there where Simba's told, oh, well, the past is the past. You got to forget it and move on and, sur- and suppress it. And you have to keep moving forward with your life. With the land before time, we have it's okay to remember and feel sad, but you also have to keep moving forward and achieving your goals and dreams. Instead of putting it behind you completely, it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling in that moment, feel that loss, feel that sadness, feel that weight of it, but still continue to keep going. And if at times, you know, if you're feeling down or sad about it and you need to go back to that, that's perfectly fine. You can be able to do that and still continue to go on with your life. It's not one or the other like some films tried to do i like i said i particularly feel the lion king was more oh well the past is the past but you have to move on because that's what you have to do i mean yeah that is what you have to do but at the same time it's okay to process how you feel and remember all the times that you've had with your lost loved one and i think that's an important thing to remind children of and even adults another theme we see in the movie is in this case interspecies friendships from a human standpoint that would just be doing interracial or diverse friendships so having a mix of different types in this case we had different dinosaurs we had a big mouth which was ducky petrie was a flyer i forget what they classified spike as you know little tooth a long neck Sarah three horn which is a triceratops so you have all these diverse different groups and genders coming together and working together and forming friendships and I think that's important not only for children but adults as well because sometimes we kind of get into our bubbles and forget that there are other people with other experiences I think it's important to show kids that you just don't have to stick to being friends with one type of race one type of gender one type of person everyone's getting together to make a common goal happen and I think that's good to encourage diverse friendships which I think the movie did really well I do just want to mention that the land before times became insanely popular and of course that went on to spawn off a whole bunch of spin-offs I believe there's 13 sequels to the to the original land before time And then, of course, there was the series that they have of it. Bluth was not involved with those, but it's something worth mentioning. So on to Bluth's fourth film in his career, which was done in 1989, All Dogs Go to Heaven. And people would argue that this is kind of where things started to go downhill for Bluth and his productions, but it's still a pretty good movie. One of my favorites as a child in the movie there's this dog charlie barkin who is partners with another dog called carface and they run like a little casino in new orleans so charlie and his friend itchy who helps him run the casino as charlie and itchy get sent to the pound and then they come back to help run the casino again and all that Carface ends up convincing Charlie to leave town with half the profits because he doesn't want to split everything with him. So he's like, dude, just take the money and go. So Charlie's like, okay, cool. But 
he ends up getting murdered by Carface by having him get hit by a car. Charlie dies and he ends up going to heaven. Charlie's not cool with this. He wants to go back to earth and live. So he tricks the angel up there into giving him this clock, which is basically a metaphor for his life. So he takes that, he goes back to earth and he reunites with Itchy and he wants to get revenge on Carface for killing him. In the process, they run into this little orphan girl named Anne Marie, who has the ability to talk to animals, which Carface has been using to take advantage for winning bets. So if there was like a horse race or a mouse race or something like that, Charlie would just have, sorry, not Charlie, Carface would have Anne Marie talk to the animals involved in the race and then he would find out who would win the race. Oftentimes the animals would talk it over and be like, okay, well, you're going to win the race this time or next time you'll win the race or blah, blah, blah. Charlie ends up taking Anne Marie away going, oh, this is a rescue. I'm here to rescue you and help you find a new family. And of course, Carface gets pissed at that and shenanigans ensue. There's a lot of adult themes in the movie, obviously. There's gambling, drinking, murder, obviously. Those are surprisingly intense for for kids. I mean, half of it went over my head as like a child. Like, it was just like, oh, everything's animated and colorful. Well, not too colorful, but everything's animated. And for the most part, the movie was, you know, kind of fun and games. Oh, we're at the horse track and I'm pretending to be an adult and we're kind of singing every once in a while. Everything's fun. So, I mean, even though there was the adult themes in there that adults can kind of appreciate and enjoy even now, it was, it was fine as a kid, I think personally. Also goes into the complexities of what makes someone good or bad. By any stretch of the imagination, Charlie wasn't the best dog out there. He's gambling, he's drinking, he's lying, he's stealing. He's doing all these bad kind of things, but it's obvious that he still cares for Anne Marie. He does want her to have a good home. He does care about his business partner, Itchy, as well. So he does care about other people around him. He is a generous and caring dog, however, morally and within his character, maybe not so much. We've all had that person in our lives that they kind of do shitty things, but at the heart of it, they are a pretty good person. They they just kind of don't have their life together or they just went down a wrong path or a different path. I shouldn't necessarily say wrong maybe a path that is considered immoral or unconventional. Nothing wrong with gambling as long as you're doing it in moderation. Same with drinking, but some people kind of look down upon those things. And of course, if you do those to excess or if they're hurting other people around you, then of course that's not good either. But Like I said, I think we've all had that person in our lives who are living kind of a lifestyle that is kind of looked down upon and not approved of, but deep down, they're still a good person. They're still good inside of them. And I think that's something that all dogs go to heaven explored, that just because someone does shitty things or has a lifestyle that's frowned upon, that doesn't mean that they can't be a good person or do good things in the end. Now, there was a little bit of controversy surrounding the film. There was a scene where Charlie had a nightmare where he went to hell and that was super scary. Basically, like he's kind of in like this river of of hellfire and stuff and then like the devil springing up there's like monsters it's really intense it's a really intense nightmare scene apparently there is another scene in uh with hell or in hell towards the end i believe that was in the film or it was cut from the nightmare but i believe there was an additional hell scene I don't believe anyone's seen it. I think there is a clip floating around online that does show some imagery from hell, but I think that Don Bluth is the only one with like a master cut 
of the full hell scene but i think if you look online there may be like an alternate scene there that you can find but like i said i think i think don bluth is the one with the master cut of the hell scene for all dogs go to heaven the additional one there's another really out of place scene in the movie that has caused quite a bit of a stir and controversy throughout the years when I thought when I watched it as a kid I really didn't think anything of it but now looking back on it as an adult it's really out of place if you've ever watched the movie then you probably guessed what scene I'm talking about by now and that's the alligator scene Anne Marie and Charlie get separated from Itchy and they ended up being with this alligator and the alligator's trying to kill them, but suddenly, like, a song breaks out, and Charlie and the alligator are singing, and they're spared. They're spared because the alligator was so en enthralled by Charlie singing. And, yeah, um, if you ever go to watch it, it's, it's actually kind of bizarre, and it's really out of place for the movie. And you'll start to see, like, other weird out-of-place things things as well in future Don Blue films. If it was maybe in a different movie or the tone of the overall movie was different, then I guess it would be fine, but it's really out of place and bizarre. I mean, the alligator does show up towards the end of the film during the showdown between Charlie and Scarf and uh and Carface, but it's just really bizarre and weird and it has garnered a lot of flack throughout the years about it which is understandable because it is super fucking weird overall the film didn't do fantastically universal was unhappy with it as far as the amount of money it made and of course a lot of critics were like why is this a children's film which is understandable because there's themes of murder, gambling, death, drinking, imagery of hell, and then a bit of darker humor, but it received mostly positive reviews by critics. It did also have quite a bit of spin-offs and sequels. We have All Dogs Go to Heaven 2, there was a television series, All Dogs Go to Heaven the series, and then there was a Christmas special and All Dogs Christmas Carol. Don Bluth wasn't associated with it. The sequels were okay. I did watch the TV show as a kid, but I don't really remember it. All Dogs Christmas Carol, it's okay. I mean, it's like any other kind of Christmas special going off of a Christmas Carol. Pretty formulaic. As long as you follow the formula, you can't really screw it up too bad. All Dogs Go to Heaven too. I don't really remember it that well, but I guess it was passable. But like I said, Bloof didn't have anything to do with any of the sequels or spinoffs, so the quality of them is kind of moot. But just some things that I thought were worth mentioning about it. And now we come to one of the most controversial films of all time, Rockadoodle in 1992. I never saw it, but it was a critical and financial failure, apparently. If you look online, I believe Nostalgia Critic and a few other people talked about it, and they all say it's awful. To be fair, from the clips and stuff that I've seen, it doesn't look that great. But let's talk about what it's about. A rooster who convinces all the animals on the farm that he lives in that because of his singing, the sun rises. Well, one day he doesn't crow and the sun rises anyway. So the animals all get mad and re ridicule him. So he fucks off to the big city and then the sun disappears for days. The farm is at risk for flooding and another animal as well as a little boy who's been transformed into a cat for whatever reason goes to find him in the city to convince him to come back to the farm so the sun can rise again. Critical failure. I believe critics only gave it like a 20% and it was one of those films that kind of mixed live action with animation and I feel like this was done in 92, so I would say probably around or in between Space Jam and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but flip that for time frame. I think 
Who Framed Roger Rabbit came first and then Space Jam. So it probably fell during this time. Rockadoodle probably fell like right in the middle or sometime during that frame where that kind of thing was popular. And I feel like that has to be done in like a certain way or else it's not going to work. Space Jam and Who Framed Roger Rabbit are the only films that I think that walk that line well between live action and animation. And honestly, I would say Who Framed Roger Rabbit did it better. But I digress. Rockadoodle was a complete failure and Don Bluth's studio started to kind of go into the decline severely at this point after all dogs go to heaven and then this things started to go down and take a really weird and bizarre turn so next up we have thumbelina in 1994 again this one was also a critical and financial failure i would agree that this isn't the best Don Bluth movie out there, but it's passable. I don't think it was terrible. There were a lot of things that it definitely could have improved on. We'll get to all that in a second. We're all pretty familiar with the basic story or the folklore behind Thumbelina. She was a little girl that was born in a flower and she's very small and she's taken in by this old woman who raises her as a daughter. And even though Thumbelina loves her mom a lot, she just wants to be with people her own size. She ends up meeting Cornelius, who is Prince of the Fairies. He agrees to come back for her and, you know, take her away because they're completely in love with each other. But Thumbelina ends up getting kidnapped by Mrs. Toad, who wants to have her marry her son. From there, everything kind of snowballs. Thumbelina is taken here, there, everywhere by men who are, and women, because Mrs. Toad was the one who kidnapped her, who are basically trying to use her with the exception of a bird named Giacomo, who just wants to be her friend and who wants to help her find Cornelius because he wants her to be happy and be with whoever she wants to be with. Thumbelina is thrown here, there, everywhere basically by people who want to either use her or marry her and who don't really have her best interest at heart. Now, there is a lot of problems with the film. The songs are terrible. I think it could have done without all of them. The one song that's passable is the one where Mrs. Shrew is trying to convince her to marry the mole. I think that's what the song is called. And that one's okay. But other than that, all the singing can can go. And the plot itself is also too fast. And it's also so fast that it kind of becomes nonsensical. Because like I said, Thumbelina is thrown here, there, everywhere. Mrs. Toad kidnaps her so she can marry her son. But she escapes to go find Cornelius. Then she kind of gets taken in by this beetle, Berkeley beetle, who loves her singing voice. And he'll show her the way home if she sings at his beetle ball. Thumbelina agrees and she's doing okay there. But then they notice that she's not a beetle and they call her ugly and shit. She runs away. But Giacomo saves her and that's when she gets with, sorry, Miss Field Mouse. She's not a shrew. She's a field mouse. She introduces her to Mr. Mole who wants to marry her because She's so beautiful and all that. And he keeps Cornelius from her after he tries to find her. But Cornelius ends up saving the day with the help of Giacomo and the two get married. Despite how fast the plot moves, there are some important messages I feel in there. Like friendship. The friendship between Thumbelina and Giacomo is nice because he seems to be the only person in the world that actually cares for Thumbelina as a person. Like, he doesn't care about her for her beauty, for her singing voice, for any type of thing that she could do for him. He just likes her for her. And I think that's important for young kids to know in a friendship. You want to have friends and lovers, of course who like you for you and not just what you can do for them and how you look. There's important themes of personal autonomy there as well, especially for young girls, because like I said, almost every male character 
and most of the female characters in this movie are kind of pieces of shit. I say this because they only care about Thumbelina for what she could do for them or how she looked. The Beetle, he only was interested in Thumbelina and lied to her because she was great at singing. And he was like, you know, I could use this for my personal gain. Mr. Mole only really liked Thumbelina again because she could sing and because she was pretty and that's why he wanted to marry her. He was an old man trying to get a young baby. And then Mrs. Toad was like, oh, look at this young cute thing. She can sing and marry my son. And in the same grain, you could say the same for Mrs. Field Mouse, who was like, oh, well, I would like a man like that. And since he won't marry me, what I can do is I can hook him up with this young girl and he'll continue to be nice to me and help me out because I helped him out by getting him a nice young girl. But... Thumbelina was kind of like, fuck all that. I'm my own woman. I don't want any of this. I want to go be with the man I love and live the life I want to lead. And I think that's important for young girls and young men to know as well that what you want is just as important as what other people want. You don't have to please everyone all the time or do things to make them happy. Next up, we have a troll in Central Park which was also done in 94. I haven't seen this film in a really long time, so unfortunately I can't really comment as to the quality of it. The only thing I remember is the song that Stanley the Troll sings, which is absolutely green. I really like that song. I still listen to it every now and again. It was pretty much a critical and financial failure for Don Bluth. The art's not terrible, But it is kind of a departure from what we've seen before, as is the subject matter a little. It's more baby hour, it seems, as opposed to having any real kind of substance to it. But basically, what the movie is about is Stanley, a troll who has a magic green thumb with the ability to bring flowers and plant life to light at a touch but that's forbidden in his kingdom of the trolls. So once it's found out that he can do this, he's banished and he ends up in Central Park. He ends up meeting two siblings there, Gus and Rosie, and he ends up becoming friends with them. And anyway, after that, some weird kind of shenanigans ensue because Gamora, for whatever reason, although she banished Stanley, gets pissed off that he's making friends with children. And she goes on a mission to destroy Central Park. But Stanley does his best to heal it. She also kidnaps the kids, I guess as bait for Stanley, so she can destroy him. And then they kind of battle with their thumbs. Ganora with Dark Thumb and Stanley with his Green Thumb. And of course he ends up winning. Gus also kind of gets turned into a troll as well and she ends up using Gus's thumb when he's a troll to turn Stanley into stone which sends the two kids back home and then the next day when they go to the park they see that Stanley is now a stone statue and then when Gus tries to revive him with his green thumb he fails but as they go to leave they notice that Stanley's gone but they hear him whistle and they see him standing on the trees with his flowers he's restored to life and he starts to revive Central Park and covers the entire city of Manhattan with plant life and flowers at this point Ganora is three throne and the king at the time decides that he's just gonna become a nicer guy complete nightmare of a plot. It was a critical and financial failure. I do remember enjoying it as a child, but from the way it looks now, I could say that I probably wouldn't enjoy a movie like this. Uh, The plot's pretty incoherent from what I can see from the synopsis that I just kind of went over with you, and it also just kind of seems like baby hour. The animation was great, Not as good as some of the other things, but it's passable, it's fine. And then we have the Pebble and the Penguin. This went completely left. So this was also deemed a failure, and this was not the original story that Don Bluth had envisioned. 
he wanted to make something else called a penguin story, but the studio demanded so many changes that the original concept was unrecognizable, so he left during production and asked not to be credited. Basically, what the pebble and the penguin is about was this penguin named Huey, who wants to marry this other penguin, Marina, and he wants to find find the perfect pebble for her, but another rival penguin named Drake wants to marry her instead, and shenanigans kind of ensue there with Huey being stranded and befriending kind of a rock hopper penguin who wants to learn how to fly, and it's about him getting back to Marina so he can propose to her and so they can be together. I did like this film as a child, but as an adult, I'm not too sure if I would like it now. It's been a while since I've watched it. It did that thing where, kind of like we'll see in Anastasia did, where it has the villain being of a darker skin tone than the other penguins. And we see that in a lot of films, unfortunately, during this time. Pebble and the Penguin was made in 95. Anastasia, which we're going to talk about next, was made in 97. And we see this in Aladdin, where, you know, Jafar is of darker skin. Scar, he's a darker lion. And it runs with that stereotype of dark, bad, light, good. I'm not saying that the the production teams on any of these were racist. However, it is kind of ingrained in us that things that are lighter, brighter, those things are good as as opposed to things that are dark. Like we always see the sun as a symbol of goodness, purity, as opposed to darkness as something that's scary, frightening, bad. We've grown up with images that opposing colors, black and white, light and dark, as a way to like symbolize Good guy, bad guy, good thing, bad thing. We see that a lot, unfortunately. Anyway, I don't know if you would count this or not as one of Don Blue's films since he was not credited for it and since everything was changed so much that he left to be asked uncredited. But I thought it was worth noting and I kind of wonder what his original concept was and how that would have been. I, I don't think we'll ever see that be made, but I'm sure the original true vision would have would have been passable. The pebble and the penguin is passable for me at least, but I know a lot of people don't like it, critics included. So we trek along to 97's Anastasia. This film kind of brought Don Bluth back on the map. I know a lot of people now don't like the film. A lot of people complain about the voice acting. They think Meg Ryan was miscast as Anastasia. But overall, the film did receive relative critical success. And it was a huge commercial hit as well, making over $138 million worldwide. This was done by Fox 20th Century Animation's division. Now, this film, obviously, because it's about the story of the lost... Russian princess Anastasia. It was more Disney-esque in nature, a fair amount of singing, a more of a Disney feel, but that's kind of forgivable because that's where Blue came from. He came from Disney. And of course, especially because it's talking about the story of a long lost princess. I mean, that's, that's Disney's bread and butter. So of course, it's going to feel quite Disney. But I think it did a good balance of balancing the sinister and the sweet But before we get into that, let's just talk about what it's about. A girl who is orphaned, she's probably a teenager, early 20s, let's say around there. And she's got no memory of her past. And instead of going to the village she's supposed to when leaving the orphanage, she just decides to go to the city and see what happens. So there's two con men there, Dimitri and Vlad, and they're trying to find a girl to play the lost princess Anastasia to meet with the Grand Duchess because there's, you know, reward money for it. So they notice Anastasia and they're like, well, her name is Anya before they find out she's the princess. So they discover Anya and they're like, hmm, you know, she could work. And they convince her that you could be that lost princess and we're going to get this done for you. So they hammer her in with facts, details, and things like that. But it's clear that 
this chick could actually be the princess because she remembers certain details and things that they didn't supply her with. Things that only the real princess would know. Rasputin is awoken because he's like, no, this bitch is, is alive and I don't like that. And I want all the Romanovs dead. As she's trying to get to the Grand Duchess to test her for being Anastasia, he tries to kill her along the way, but eventually they do get to her and it is revealed that Anya is actually the lost princess Anastasia and there's a big showdown with Rasputin and it works out okay. Despite it being more Disney, I think it does do a good job of balancing, you know, scarier elements. When Rasputin tries to murder her and Dimitri and Vlad, I mean, those scenes are pretty intense. The final showdown is also pretty intense. Rasputin as a villain is also pretty scary. I mean, the songs in the movie are okay. Uh, again, I could do without them, but they're not terrible. Once Upon a December, everybody loves that song. In the Dark of the Night, which is the song that Rasputin sings isn't terrible. So the songs are passable, but again, I could do without them. And I think it was a pretty good film. I don't really have any negative things to say about it, except for like I did mention with the Pebble and the Penguin, it does that thing where villain dark-skinned, villain bad. In this case, he was a rotting corpse, so of course that's going to be darker skinned than Anastasia, but it's just something common that you see in a lot of animated films during that time. Again, it's just something that I don't think was a conscious decision, but that thematic thing of light, good, dark, bad is something that's so ingrained in us that I don't think people really realize when it happens sometimes so forgivable it's not anything to go rah, 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 about so in 1999 we did have a follow-up to this Bartok the Magnificent I didn't see it I'm not sure if anyone really saw it so it looks like this is kind of a prequel to the Anastasia film basically it centers around the young czar Ivan being kidnapped Prior to the Russian Revolution, the plot seems pretty nonsensical. There's a bear, the Baba Yaga, and it just kind of seems like a silly plot. As far as reception goes, it didn't do that great critically. Of course, uh, they said it would be appealing to kids, but not so much for... But it did get nominated for some awards. It got nominated for an Annie Award for Outstanding Achievement in Animated Home Video Production. Sound editing as well. It got nominated for a few awards there, but never won. It's not really a talked about film. Kind of low-key, and it's pretty much all that I can say about it since I've never watched it. And honestly, just kind of reading the synopsis here off wiki, it's not something that I would really want to see. But if you're interested in checking it out, you can find it on YouTube and Amazon Prime to rent. Last but not least, we have Titan AE, which was in 2000. Now, this film was a mix of hand-drawn and computer-generated animations. I liked Titan AE. I still watch it sometimes to this day. It's a pretty good film. It's a sci-fi film taking place in the future where humanity is basically living in space after Earth was destroyed by a force called the Dredge, which is an energy-based alien species. It's basically found out that the main character's father, Kale, his dad had produced a map as well as a way to create a new Earth so humans could go back there and, and live on it which is something that the Dredge also wants because for whatever reason they hate humans and they don't want them to live on their own planet. So it basically revolves around Kale and a few other aliens as well as a Earth woman played by Drew Barrymore, Akima, who also wants to help create this new Earth for them to live on. It did pretty well at the box office. It opened at number five. It dropped to number eight on its second weekend, but 
overall it did it did okay I mean the film did lose money but the reviews were about split it has about a 5.7 51% approval rating and it was also nominated for awards overall I did like the movie it was a lot of action and adventure a lot of betrayal and I think it went back to kind of blues roots in the sense that it's not just something that a child could enjoy it's something that an adult could enjoy as well it's got a lot of action adventure drama that i feel like a lot of some of the films were lacking um even though a lot of them were still adventurous they were more childish in nature and i feel like this film kind of got back to the roots of okay well this is something that an adult too can sit down and enjoy. Unfortunately, this was the last film that Don Bluth was ever involved in. He did work on a video game, a video game series, and that was Dragon's Lair. So he worked on that game series for a bit, and he is currently doing animation education through like video tutorials short films, video seminars. I think recently he star announced starting that back up, teaching classes again through that sense, so you can learn things from him. You could probably find out more through his Twitter. He does have a Twitter account that you can look at and it'll mention like exactly when those are running. I think there were also tapes that he made as well that you could watch showing some of his techniques and stuff. I don't think he will make any more movies i mean the man is currently 81 years old so he's a little bit up there but i also think from what i've read in interviews and things like that he's kind of gotten disillusioned with the industry in the sense that it's not just about the story that you can tell and the creativity that you could bring to the table but rather is it going to sell we have to follow this corporate need and that corporate need and things like that. So I think those are things that bothered him initially when he left Disney. And I think that becoming so pervasive throughout the animation industry as well as the movie and television industry have also been a turn off for him. And then I've also seen things mentioned where he's not super happy with the way animators kind of rely on computer generated animation and graphics now. While hand drawing is still important and good, a lot of stuff we see now does kind of rely or lay heavily on computer animated graphics. And I feel like even though there are things that are similar, that artists who use that as opposed to hand drawing things have in common, I think that doing that for him kind of meshing into that world even though he did it a little with titan ae i don't think would be good for him i've seen it in interviews and articles that i was reading when i was doing research for all of this how he kind of wasn't happy with that and he was like oh well it's two different worlds and it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks so i don't think he would be super stoked to go back to that especially with that being so pervasive into the current animation scene so I don't think we'll see anything from him in regards to that anytime soon uh, maybe a new dragon lair game I think that would probably be the only possibility for seeing future works from him but unfortunately I don't know the real status of those games or if there would be another one Whew. so that's basically it this podcast is hella long it'll probably be like mm, maybe like an hour-ish depending on how much I cut down. There's a lot of pauses and stuff that I have to edit out so that's going to be fun but this is definitely probably the longest podcast I'll ever do but I thought it was important to talk about his whole career because like I said Don Bluth provided such an alternative to what Disney gave and I think that was important. Disney always while it has engaged in some darker stuff like the Black Cauldron we're going to talk about for the most part, it's light, fun, magic. Everything's gonna work out. In Don Blue's films, everything does work out in the end. However, it's not afraid to get dark and gritty and to remind you that, hey, you can solve your own problems. Magic doesn't 
always solve it for you. You have to make the magic. You have to do the things to make your life better. And at the end of the day, things will be okay as long as, you know, you put in the work. And I think that's important for for everyone, kids, adults. I think that's real important to know. And his films definitely made my childhood a whole lot interesting. Despite all the failures in his career, it's really admirable that he kept trying to make things. I think that's so important and so great that, like I said, despite all the failures, he still kept going. He still made whatever the fuck he wanted to make, however the fuck he wanted to make it. And if people didn't like it, I mean, too bad. He just did what he wanted to do. And I think that spirit is so wonderful and so great and something that I like to try to embody for myself, knowing that there's someone out there that, you know, said, hey, fuck it, I'm gonna do what I want to do. And I don't care who likes it or who doesn't like it. This is me. This is what I make. Take it or leave it. And I think that's really cool. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. The next podcast, it will be Pom Poco and Grave of Fireflies. And you should see that next week. And I should be starting my 30-day video challenge. It'll probably happen sometime after this has gone out. So if you start seeing like a video every day for the next 30 days, that's why. Just to kind of get me used to making things again. They may not all be media and pop culture related. They may be about my life, different experiences, vlogs, things like that. But I will try to keep it as pop culture and media related as I can. But um, you may see some other things from me. So thank you so much for listening. Comments and feedback are welcomed and appreciated. And I will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye, bye, bye.